Hi, so in the previous video I discussed what we mean by the solo residual and talked about how we might derive it and a couple of other things, so check out that video if you haven't already. And in this video I'm going to talk about the some of the problems with the solo residual and in particular maybe just one problem which has caused a bit of an issue for some models in the past. So we showed that the solo residual GA as written here can be shown to be equal to this term on the right hand side and it's just all of our components of output growth that aren't explained by primary factors of production. And now an, one issue with the solo residual arises when we actually try to estimate the solo residual. And obviously if we're going to use this we, we need to get some sort of value for it and I noted in the previous video how some estimates for this show it to be accounting for half of growth, others maybe it accounts for a quarter of growth, and some of this variation will come from using different economies, different times, uh, say in 1950 versus in the year 2000, um, but okay we, we want to estimate this at some time period. And the way we do this is by just estimating this right hand side of the equation. So we can get a pretty good estimate for what our increase or our growth rate of output is. It's maybe we have a 2% target, say in the UK, and our our growth rate, we, we can figure that out from just the, the normal ways. How do we find the growth rate of the capital stock? Well, we can, we can estimate this and we can estimate our growth in labor supply using fertility and death rate figures and so on. And then what we want to estimate is alpha and one minus alpha, our income share for each of these primary factors of production. And we do this using the national accounts. We've got pl plenty of data for these. So we can estimate al alpha using our national account data. And okay, so we, we can decompose our output into these growth rates and uh, there may be a bit of measurement error the national accounts aren't perfect they maybe use survey data because we can't know every every piece of equipment that's owned in every factory for example and we may have some measurement error in our population growth rate and our actual gdp measures so that's one that's one issue is just the growth counting does come with some measurement error especially if we're looking at historical data and there are loads of historical papers, say, from the 19th century and the 18th century that do talk about how there's lots of missing data and it's very difficult to do this. But if we're talking about today, even if we are estimating the solar residual, we can consider an issue, say, where we have a demand shock. And we've got estimates for alpha, we've got estimates for our growth rates of everything, and we have a demand shock. And let's say it's a negative demand shock. We might view this as a reduction in productivity in period two in the future. So nothing has changed today, but consumers may have the expectation that in the future we're going to have a reduction in output or so on. And this can be shown by a reduction in confidence of consumers. And so this reduction in A2 or this demand shock is going to reduce our output today because we have a reduction in demand. The equilibrium of aggregate demand and aggregate supply is going to be a reduced level of output. However, after this demand shock, we might have the capital stock remaining constant and the labor stock also remaining constant. What do I mean by this? Well, that firms don't just sell off loads of capital and they don't sack a load of workers. They don't make lots of people unemployed, cutting down the labor force. And why why is this common? Well, we, we know that when we have a short-term demand shock, firms don't tend to just start um, firing all their workers. They tend to hold on to their workers. There's lots of regulations in place in reality that, that, that try to reduce the, or try to give people job security. So you have to pay severance to employees. There are, there are lots of costs in recruiting new employees. So firms tend to want to hang on to their employees and we call this labor hoarding that even when there's a reduction of demand for a firm's product they'll they'll hang on to their labor for a little while just in case say the demand picks back up again and they'll just hang on and so we're going to have that the labor that we do have is just going to reduce its effort 
So we're going to have the same amount of workers, but with less to do. So each worker is just going to reduce their effort, and that, that's fine. But our labor stock, the point is that our labor stock stays the same. Or our, in the national account, the national accounts are going to tell us that the labor stock is the same. And the same is true with the capital stock, that when there's a reduction in demand firms, say with factories, they're just going to make their capital work a a little less, or they'll turn off, say, some of, some of the um, the machines in their factory because they don't need to produce as much output. There's there's less demand for the good, so they're just going to get their machines to work a bit less. They're not necessarily going to sell their machines off and and just destroy their machines or whatever. They'll they'll just slow the machines down for now, in with the intention of increasing the the workload of their machines in future when demand picks up and this is called a reduction in capacity utilization capacity utilization if i can spell it and so okay so we have a reduction in y but our capital and our labor remains the same so looking at our equation at the top of the screen although it is covered in arrows and boxes well we have got y is constant g is con or gk is constant and gl is constant alpha stays the same and alpha stays the same so the only thing that can change is this ga the solo residual as is shown here by what we conclude from this is that we have a reduction in our productivity parameter or our total factor productivity or the solo residual so our gy uh, is negative or we could say it's less than zero our gk will say is equal to zero gl is equal to zero so that means that ga is less than zero and in reality it's not necessarily the case that our technology parameter has fallen we we could view this as a reduction in productivity potentially depending on how we view productivity that the these workers are putting in less effort so they're less productive but this isn't usually what we tend to think about when we think of this technology parameter. We tend to want to think about this as sort of increasing the effectiveness of workers. It's they start to work in more intelligent ways. It's not really how much effort that they put in. So this is a big issue with the solar residual in its current form as we've written it down, because it is currently capturing lots of demand aspects of the economy from demand shocks when when we think about the TFP or the technology parameter, we tend to want to be thinking of supply shocks and shocks to the way things are done on the supply side. We don't really want this to be taking into account our demand shocks. That's a completely different side of the economy. And in the solo model, the demand side of the economy is just completely de determined by our constant savings rate. So we don't really consider the possibility of a demand shock because we just have people constantly saving the same proportion of income. So how do we correct this issue with the solo model? Well, we have to com or account for this capacity utilization in the model. And this, this is not beyond the realms of possibility to do. And it has been done in a number of papers where we say, okay, our capital stock and our labor stock is constant, but we can start to estimate how much they're actually being utilized. And this can adjust our solo residual. But in fact, it, it doesn't adjust our solar residual because as I've defined it, this is this is the solar residual, this GA in terms of this form. So when we start adjusting it for capacity, capacity utilization, it's no longer really the solar residual. So this is the problem is that the solar residual itself isn't great. What is actually now used in most papers is not the solar residual at all. Uh, we use an adjusted value that actually tries to measure increases in technology and increases in total factor productivity. So once we account for this capacity utilization, we this greatly reduces the fluctuations we see in TFP and we start to just be able to see something that we can potentially model as some constant growth rate in technology because it is just looking at more at supply side shocks and technological innovations. How do we actually go about mo modeling capacity utilization? I'll just give say one or two examples. So for the capacity utilization of 
say firms and machinery, we can look at electricity usage is one way. So in a factory, we could say at, at peak times where there's high demand, factories are out are using say one million kilowatts of electricity or whatever. And in times of low demand, they're only using 500,000 kilowatts. And in both of these times, they have the same capital stock of machinery, but in one they're working half as hard. So we can take this into account and it's nothing has changed. They haven't reduced their productivity of the actual machines. They, they're just working it less hard. And with the labor supply, it's a little more tricky because we're, we're looking at effort, which isn't necessarily observable. So you may have to take surveys or uh, come up with some sort of experiment or some, some controlled situation where we can see how, how hard labor is working. But again, th this draws into question, it's quite difficult to estimate total factor productivity. And this is always an issue with researchers that all of these measures are their estimates. And so there is some measurement error, as I have mentioned previously in this video. But that is a key issue when you're using the solar residual, that you need to note that it is picking up lots of different shocks as it is a residual. It's picking up everything that isn't accounted for in the capital stock and in the labor stock. And the capital stock and labor stock don't tell us the whole story of everything. So anything that isn't accounted by accounted for by them is picked up in our solar residual because we have a very simplistic model that's a lot of things that aren't picked up there so thanks for watching please do leave a like if this was at all useful do subscribe for lots more economics videos and check out the playlist for future videos on the solo growth model